A, C, and D, and various populations here. But you can see, for example, like um, this group has A, it has B, it has C, but where's D? It doesn't mean that 300 years ago they didn't have D here. So what I'm trying to say is that, and, and it's the same for all these, you see a population history written in every one of these people. And we're seeing the buds on the tips of the trees. We're not seeing the branches, we're not seeing the trunks. So everyone, I mean, for example, this one, um, this group of people, they're missing three of these. This one, this one probably is not fair. This, this is Caribbean, so they're probably islanders, which means there's more of a, a reduction yet. So, and I think this also speaks of selection once again. So why wouldn't all these be at, at the same frequency? Now, if we want to look at the way we do genealogy, say, I'm right here, and I want to move back a couple generations, we can see that every generation, um, and, and now I should say I'm talking about nuclear DNA, I'm not talking about mitochondria or, or Y chromosome, but at every generation receding, your number of ancestors doubles. Now, when you get back so many generations, um, a, a lot of people, I mean, I have people tell me, you know, in, in my war at home, well, I'm related to so-and-so, um, the, the king of France back in 1400. Well, you may be related to the king of France because there's one of these lines that comes your way, but you're also related to everybody else. You may be related to um, Siegfried here that was thrown in jail, you may be related to um, so-and-so here that was a bank robber. And so there's a lot of people that you become related to. And the chances that your DNA, their DNA is in you, very, very small. It's like winning the lottery. And once again, that's just the population genetics. So this is really called um, the law of increasingly remote and genetically irrelevant ancestors. <laughs> I don't make this stuff up. Then uh, another interesting note that I think has been forgotten, and this comes from, um, from the Dakla Oasis. Um, there is a Romano-Coptic Christian site here in the, in the Dakla Oasis. And it looks like the people were, were proselyted. Coptic Christian just means Egypt. And there was a time when the early Christian movement moved through throughout Egypt and proselyted people in their native tongue. And these oases exist as big footprints out in the sand on the west side of the Nile, which is kind of interesting in, in and of itself. If you're Egyptian, why would you live out in the west desert? Because that's the land of the dead. Who wants to live out in the land of the dead? Um, but anyway, they did. And here's a view of the ancient town of Kellis. And if you can look off to, I believe this is the east, um, there's the desert escarpment that moves up. These are sand dunes, and then here's the town of, of ancient Kellis. Well, in Kellis, um, there's a cemetery called um, Kellis II. Kellis II is very interesting because they buried everything. They buried stillborn, they buried um, children that died, um, they buried fetuses. And so, we really get a look at ancient population demographics. And what's interesting when we want to think of um, the Book of Mormon and trying to push these genetics from the ancient Near East up through this population is that the pre-reproductive mortality rate is 63%. So over half of your children don't make it to have more children. And, you know, a lot of these, they were Christian, they believed in God as well. So God isn't, isn't selective among his people. We're sent here, we have to put up with, with the physical, physical facts. So there you go, there is another genetic bottleneck. So I think from all this, um, 
I would um, like to conclude that these small kin associate groups that we see in the Book of Mormon are at genetic disadvantages. Um, there were large indigenous populations in Mesoamerica, 600 BC, and the Book of Mormon populations assimilated into, these ancient, into the ancient genetic topography of Mesoamerica with these mitochondrial haplotypes A, B, C, D, and X. So do Book of Mormon people have the same mitochondrial haplotypes as Native Americans? Yes, they were assimilated in, but they were a small part that were participating in this in a specific geographical area. And once again, I think the really important, in, in sort of our, you know, science always thinks that it has all of the answers right now. But we always live in, in an age of, of ignorance. And that is, assuming that these current population data um, are adequate for this test, they're just simply not. I think if you were to be intellectually honest with yourself, it just isn't possible to really reconstruct these. What you'd have to do is you would have to find a cemetery where Nephi and everybody was buried and then do ancient DNA analysis on those individuals. But it looks like fairly quickly um, this population was, was eclipsed and this story wouldn't be different for any of us that would move into a, a large foreign population. I mean, pretty soon our kids start talking like so-and-so, start acting like so-and-so. There's only a certain number of people you can pick to be married to. And if they did stay together, um, then you have a lot of problems with recessive alleles um, starting to pair up, and there's a lot of genetic problems with that. And finally, um, I like this particular quote from Elder Maxwell. He says, because the editing of the Book of Mormon with its witnessing gospel of hope occurred under divine direction, it has a focus which is essentially spiritual. Yet some will criticize the book for being what it never was intended to be, as if someone could justifiably criticize a phone directory for lack of a plot. And for all intents and purposes, that's what we've been doing. <laughs> um, so I guess from a, from, a pers from a personal note, am I saying that we won't ever find ancient Near Eastern genetics? No, um, I think there are some tantalizing papers now that suggest that there may be um, European input, I would, I would say at this time, into these ancient populations, but um, I'm not that familiar with that information, so that, that's a subject for, um, for future study. Um, and overall, the genetic differences in the human family is, is pretty slight. And so when we all say and speak of God's children, we are all very, very closely related at a genetic level. And here we're talking about very, very small nuances and differences when we talk about A, B, um, C, and D, and X. So I think that, um, wow, I mean, we need to see in sacred scriptures its full intent and its possibilities, and not really look for its, its limitations. Um, So, really, um, mercifully, the blessings of God and the atonement, they don't have genetic constrictions. And how could they with a all-loving God? Um, we're all his children, operating under the principle of free agency, and the whole idea is whether or not we accept or deny that fact. And one final item is that I think that we as Latter-day Saints are too willing to accept what science or what critics have to say. We really need to be thoroughly skeptical of skeptics and critical of critics. Sometimes we are very gullible um, in, our, in our faith. If the boy Joseph saw Jesus Christ and God the Father in the grove, what do these criticisms really matter? That is the major fact. And so I would like to leave that with you and thank you once again.